welcome everyone to tonight's show. Tonight we have a very special guest. Her name is Ginny Drake. Uh, Virginia Drake has worked in the fields of education, social work, counseling, consulting, and motivational speaking for over 30 years. She holds a master's degree in education from Georgetown College, a teaching certificate from Eastern Kentucky University, and a BS and a Bachelor of Science degree in social work from Murray, Kentucky University in 98. Uh, Jenny had a miraculous healing after a major heart attack and near-death experience. It was then that she became interested in the mind, body, and spirit connection and the impact these forces can have on one's health and relationships. She has devoted over 20 years to intensive, intensive study of meditation, natural healing, and quantum physics and how the electromagnetic fields of the human body work in connection with the healing process. In addition to our private consulting business, Jenny also teaches workshops on developing strategies to promote a healthy and enriched life. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, Jen Jenny Drake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Since you've had one, I've had one. So what is it that we can talk about that that first thing I think a lot of people ask me is this. Is it really true that you don't die? Well, absolutely, you don't die. But people associate still as their body is going to be there. My body was gone. Okay, well, before you get into the NDE, which will obviously be the core of our conversation, I've never had an NDE, by the way. Oh, I so, thought you had. No. I am uh, very unique in many ways, but not that one. Okay. I have uh, had uh, close encounters with aliens. I've, right. had, uh, I've had things that you probably don't want to know about. If I told you about them, you probably wouldn't do this interview. But uh, <laughs> let's just say I've had a very paranormal life. Okay. And we'll go. We'll leave it at that. You can check me out if you want to listen to my interviews. I've done 30. Well, I've had some really strange ones too, because I've seen demons. I've seen red eyes. I've seen things that move in. Oh, the hold on, hold on. We're, uh, hold on just for a second. Okay, so let's do the. I like to do my interviews in chronological order. Okay. That way people have, it, it just seems better that way. Uh, I know that uh, Jeff jumped straight into the NDE. For me, for me, I would prefer to go to the very first interesting or odd or strange or paranormal or just bizarre thing that happened to you uh, in your life and then move forward chronologically. Okay. Well, I think the very first thing is I was my mother's seventh miscarriage in 1951, and I survived it. I only weighed a pound and seven ounces. And my mother and all, all my, you know, like my physician when I was young would say, you know, I'd give a plug nickel for you. Now, back then in the set, because I'm 72 years old, a plug nickel was nothing because that's what we would get in when our, you know, buildings were being built and we'd go in there and find those little uh, nickels. That's what we call them. And he said, I'd give a plug nickel for you. And that I didn't understand it at all because I didn't start growing until I got into college. Uh, I started growing, and that's what they thought was a little odd, that, you know, I was still growing, and I was 17, 18 years old. I grew two inches after I became 18 in college, which that might not be a big deal, but obviously back in the seven, uh, in the 60s it was. But I had really strange uh, things. Ever since I've been a little girl, I had, um, I was very easily, um, you know, connected to the energy of the trees. I mean, I could talk to dogs. I communicated. I was an only child, so I communicated with animals all the time. In fact, I had two veterinarians that were just starting their business that lived right in the, my street, and they would call me over when I was 12 years old. They trained me as a vet uh, attendant or assistant, and it's because I could calm down the animals when they would come in, and they recognized something that I wasn't afraid of doing operations. So I started doing operations with one of our vets uh, when I first got married. And uh, I did all this surgery with him and it, because he trained me. And I was kind of laughing 
that I was a veterinarian assistant before there was any techs even available. I was being the first tech as a 12 year old. Um, I was listening to some of the things that people were saying as being going to college. I thought, really, you went to college for that? And because um, I was trained, but I was also a lifeguard and I became a swimmer and I was a very good swimmer and I was a lifeguard and a water safety instructor. And I taught that for many, many years all over my county and all in the area. So I was a very good swimmer, but I was also a, a swimming coach. I was uh, I was a coach uh, softball for young girls. I mean, I was always a coach. I'd always been a coach of children, a coach of some way to work with kids. So that was kind of how I ended up being a teacher is because I really didn't like being a social worker. Uh, I thought it was, I didn't think I was getting where I needed to be and I wanted to be a juvenile probation officer instead. And I was one of the first juvenile probation officer women in the 70s that were going to be trained to be a juvenile probation officer. Uh, that was a big deal, obviously. I didn't know. I did a lot of things that women weren't allowed to do usually, um, and I got to do them a lot of times. So it was kind of interesting. My life anyway, it was kind of interesting how it all worked out. Uh, I did watch my father when I was 11, watch him die from the age of 11 to 16, my father had melanoma co cancer and they took out his eye and his palate of his mouth. And I sit and watch that as a child. And that's when I became even better. What I do now is helping people cross over because I saw my father cross over. And it was a horrible experience for a little girl. And after I had my near death experience, it gave me a different take on it and what to talk to people. So I became as a counselor for hospice. I didn't work with them personally. I got called a lot of times when hospice was telling them they would call me and I would go in and I would help them cross over. I'll be work with the family and talk to them about how to talk to them. And, you know, after you've had a near death experience and I've had several, so it really does. You have a different take on all the world anyway it you see things totally different uh you don't have the fear that you had before death is not what it was to, you know my my first experience with death was watching my father die which was horrendous and i thought that's the way it was it is not like that at all it was it was different at the beginning but it was not scary so between um let me turn on my light between your father's death and your death or your first end to eat right uh, what else did you have that was interesting that happened to you well let's see well i was almost raped three times but let me okay let me go all the way back then because when my father was in the process of dying my best friend got into a car accident at the age of 15. these are the pit, two big people in my life and both of them were dying so i went to the church. I was a Catholic. I had not, uh, I converted to being a Catholic because of my father. And um, I went into the church. This is in the 60s. Church is lit. There was nobody in there. And I'm praying. I'm praying to have my father and my best friend to be miraculously healed by Jesus and God. And I remember, I mean, I am, oh, I'm praying. And all of a sudden I felt the energy or the sound of Jesus literally fell off of the, the cross. That sounds crazy, but it happened. And he walks all the way across. I can, I can see, I can hear him, but I never could see him until he came to the pew. And then he started scooting up to the pew and he hit me and he put his arm around me and he said, I've got that. And I thought, oh, he, he heard my prayers. And uh, I remember walking out thinking, oh, my God, he heard my prayers. I tried to tell people and they wouldn't listen to me. And I said, oh, my God, Jesus, but both of them died, which took me into a very dark time in my life. I really was in hell. I didn't believe in God anymore. And I went into college at Murray, very, very dark, very hellish. Uh, and at those three things, I almost was raped three different times, but there was an energy that saved me every 
time. And the first one was a guy, his name was Steve Peace, P-E-A-S-E. -E. I'll never forget, and because God plays these little jokes, you know, like Steve Peace, yeah. Well, I wouldn't even have caught that until later. But I remember he hit me so hard that, and I'm 19 at that time, and I mean, he hit me so hard that I did see stars, and it, I hit to the other part of the wall. But there was a power in me that, and it felt like it came through the tips of my toes and raised me up. And I leaned forward to him and I put my finger right in his face. And I said, all I've got to say is this, you're going to have three girls. And every one of those girls will be raped just like you're getting ready to do to me. And it shocked him. He fell down to the floor like this. And he, it scared me. I got out because he had these bolts and I got out, out and ran down to the other apartment. And I knew somebody there and opened the door and she opened the door and uh, I got, I was safe. But that scared me. That's a, three times that happened to me. And it was always my father's voice saved me or, well, a lot of times it was my father's voice that would say, you need to stop or whatever. It was, it was an incredible time, but also I was very hellish about it. I didn't, you know, I was, I was putting myself into places that I shouldn't have been. Not in the 70s. And, well, and there was drug. Now, I didn't do drugs. I mean, I think I smoked some marijuana, but I didn't do. There was all kinds of drugs. And for some reason, through my entire college, it was not. It would be do not take that. You know, you would hear it, but it was that small voice. But you I had worked with that before because I've drowned twice. That's what saved me when I was 11 and 16, because I almost drowned when I was 11 in a life game, uh, life, uh, so life, sorry, mm -mm, lifeguard uh, class when I was 11. And then I went, I skipped school when I was 16 with my cousin and they were playing and we were at the river in Kentucky and uh, they threw a wool blanket over top of me and that blanket went straight down. And I remember it was going down and I was saying, you know, as I was going down, my mother is going to be so mad at my cousin for doing this to me because I'm going to die. And I remember, but what happened was I was going down and I knew I was going down. There was nothing. I couldn't fight the blanket. It was just, it sucked into me. I couldn't because it was wool. And I remember all of a sudden light came up underneath the blanket and pushed it off and it just kind of pulled it off and it was all these sparkling little twinkles. That's And they said, you're going to be fine. And they went underneath my feet and raised me up and threw me up into the water and said, um, I thought, you know, I thought I'd been in there for hours and I asked my cousin, he said, you were only, we were looking for you forever, but you were only out for maybe two or three minutes. You know, it wasn't anything that far or that long. It just felt that way because when you're in that state, there's no time. It's just easy. I don't know. I, you weren't scared at all. I wasn't scared. So did you figure out what that was? Well, it's just, it's spirit. It's the spirit within us. It's God, whatever you want. To, I, it could have been the water. Uh, you know, water talks. Everything is alive. And I mean, I was very blessed. I mean, that was the I've had nine of those kind of experiences. So and I've been, been in four or five car to accidents. And I mean, that saved me. But my sons, my one son is like me. He's had several things, too, that's happened to him. But we had, I had, when I had my first heart attack, when I was 46 years old, and it was like the first, it was the week before my heart attack, I had a farm. And I've been out in the farm. It was, uh, you know, just, it was like a week before I think school was going to end for the summer. And um, I just sat down in the den and there was nobody in there and the TV, I turned the TV on this guy, this little old man that had his uh, oxygen tank on and he's going, don't get a heart transplant. And I thought, wow, because he's had one and he was telling people, I thought, wow, he kept saying it to me. He said, don't get a heart transplant. 
And I thought, is he talking to me? And I would look and, he, and I thought, is he talking? There was nobody in that room, but he kept saying it. I mean, he'd get closer to me. And I thought, finally, I just, I raised my hand and said, I'm not going to get a heart transplant. I'm 46 years old. I walk four miles a day. I'm healthy, you know, and I was doing on. And the next week I was looking at one. And they had told me that I needed a heart transplant immediate. And I refused it. And then three days later, I walked out. Now, I did have a stint, but I walked out completely healed. And through that experience, it made me, it was like, dink, wake up. I had angels in there with me. I had Archangel Michael came in to visit me. The first night I was at the hospital after I'd had the stent and all of that, I remember this little light in the corner of my bed, I mean, my hospital room, it was just a little bitty dot, and then it kept getting bigger, and it get bigger, and then I thought, oh my God, this keeps getting bigger, and then it was just bigger, and the light would get bigger, and the next thing I know, it's Archangel Michael, but he is standing six feet, I mean, he's standing six floors up, and I'm down here, and I think, how does that work? How does, bad drugs, that's what I thought, bad drugs, they've given me the wrong drug, I'm now having this experience with this big angel that I don't even think can even get into the hospital rooms like that. I mean, I'm so shocked that all of this is going on. I mean, I'm like this thinking, but he comes down and looks over the top of me and says, it's time for you to wake up. And I thought, oh my God, I thought they're supposed to be nice. I thought you're supposed to be nice. He was not nice. He was very firm. He was very exact. And then all of these other angels came in, or they looked like angels, but I couldn't understand them because they were trying to talk to me at the same time. But the lady next to me in the ICU, she was in there and she was in the process of dying. She, I think she was in her 70s, which is my age now. But And at three o'clock in the morning, she had a get somebody came in. I assumed it was her son. But her son sounded just like the National Geographic narrator, as well as the Learning Channel. Being a teacher, I used those, and the narrator would have been right. I could think, God, that's, and then I'd get back into all the angels talking around me. I thought, this can't be possible. They can't be walking around, going through these walls. She's over here. It, nothing was making sense, but everything was making sense. I don't know how to explain that any other way, but it made sense. And I remember in the middle of the night, I guess she died. And um, this is still going on. And I just, I got up the next day. I mean, I couldn't get up. They told me I'd had to stay on the bed, you know, bed rest. I had to get a bedpan. And I'm th they're, I mean, they're treating me like, Man, and I'm feeling so good inside of my body. I'm thinking, I don't know why they think I'm so bad, but they scared me so bad. You know, I couldn't get up. And so the nurses came in and I said, did she pass? And uh, they said, yeah. And I said, you know, was that her son? And she said, yeah. I said, you know, he sounded just like the National Geographic uh, uh, narrator. And she said, that was him. He came in from California. And I just went, I knew then everything that happened to me over on this side is really real because I heard that too. So I knew spirit is telling me that you might not understand this, but I'm telling you that really happened. So when I remember that, I was like, I was, I even told the woman, uh, the nurse, I said, that just shocks me. And so about two or three hours later, she comes in and she said, we're going to get take you up to the treadmill and we're going to run you a little bit because we want you. I said, you all just told me I can't even get out of the bed. Are you trying to kill me? You want me to get up on a treadmill? Are you going to kill me? And, the, and she goes, no, we're not going to. I said, you're trying to kill me. I was really like that. You know, you were going to. And so in their excitement of watching me going to die, they also dropped the oxygen tank on the top of my back. And I thought, 
I don't think I said, you are really trying to hurt me. You want me to die. And they go, no, you don't. No, you don't. And they're going like this. No, you're fine. You're fine. I thought, I am not fine. You've told me I'm going to die. And this is only have six months to live. That's what they told me. And I thought, oh, now they're, t- they're just going to kill me. That's And so I remember I'm riding with these two nurses and they're really jovial. I mean, they're happy about it. I'm thinking, gosh, they're really happy about me dying. I get in the hospital, I mean, in the elevator, and this woman is in there. She said, would you touch me? And I went, touch her. And I said, I'm dying. I mean, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted that these people want me to touch them. I'm dying. And I said, well, I'm dying. And those nurses are looking at each other. I think that is really not funny. They're funny. That's not funny. So I remember I get in, and when they get in, they said, get on that treadmill and do it like that and they went like this and i went um uh, you know they're gonna kill me now my cardiologist is sitting right there and i don't remember a lot at the beginning of it until later but he's sitting there and he's like he's really upset and he's just and he said put her on the treadmill and i thought oh my god they're gonna kill me i'm just gonna die and I remember when my body started coming back in, because I, I was doing it very slow. He said, turn it up. And I'm, and then it was like I caught the energy of my entire body. It was like, yes, I'm back. And I just start because I walked. So I was really trugging it. I was, and I'm thinking, yeah, I got it. And then I thought, oh, but maybe not. Maybe, you know, and but I could feel it. And so the nurses are going like this. Yes, yes, yes. Like that. So he finally said, stop, everybody, slow down. Take her on back to her room. And I thought, and they're going, that's fabulous. Look what you've done. And I thought, I didn't die, first of all. So then when I got in that room, my husband was in there. My other doctor in my local doctor was there. And then I had the cardiologist there. And then we had the manager of the hospital there. And they're discussing me while I'm laying down and that it really wasn't a miracle. And this, it was really called shocked heart. And I'm listening to them like I don't even exist there. And I remember I raised up really strong and I said, yes, it was a miracle. I don't care what you all say, what it is. It was a miracle. And then it slid back down because I thought I'm going to have another heart attack. <laughs> they all looked at me like I've lost my mind. But I knew that I had been a, and that was a healing moment. And I knew it was my opportunity to really do something. And I remember looking back and saying, I'm never going to come back here again. And that's one of the nurses. She picked me up to take me to the, you know, to the my husband's car. And she looked at me when I got up to say goodbye. She put her arms around me. She said, don't you come back. You've given us hope. Well, I didn't even understand really until probably three or four months later that I even had a near-death experience on the table because what I remember is he had Kohan shoes, the cardiologist. I wore Kohan shoes and they're 300, at that time they were $300 a pair and I thought, where is his booties? If you put any blood on those, I'm going to have to pay for them. This is the things that go through your mind when you're having a heart attack to have them uh, clear out the clot, uh, the clot. So it was, and I remember the nurse said, how do you know he had Kohan shoes? I said, because I saw them. And I said, you didn't see the nut, the pin that he dropped. You didn't even get the pin underneath the table. That is not sterile. You And she said, you saw what? I said, there was a pen that he dropped out of his pocket when he was talking to me, and it fell under my table. She said, you've never been underneath that table. I said, well, I was under that table because I saw that. And he had Kohan shoes, and he didn't have his booties on. She said, that's when it really got, you know, when I started talking about it. They had nurses coming in there. They were asking me questions. What else did you see? I said, Well, I said, you know, I think you all really need to put something up there so that that will recognize that we are in a ceiling because I felt like I was going to leave the ceiling, but I kept getting hit by the ceiling coming back. But I was really over on the corner. But then that corner was really over. the, And I said, yeah, it just didn't make a lot of sense. And they're just staring at me, you know. So I remember those nurses knew, though, something had happened because there was a miraculous healing in three days there. And, um, yeah, because my heart came back. Now, 
every cardiologist except the one that I ended up being with, because they were treating me like I was still having a heart attack problem. And at that time, I think they gave me nine pills in 1998. And it was like, I couldn't even hardly, I thought I'm going to die with all these pills because I didn't even hardly take an aspirin, much less those pills. And one day about, I think two weeks later, I started vomiting the pills and a voice said, do not take any more of those pills. There's poison to you. And I just took them and put them in the trash bin and never sent them off. And my husband at the time said, uh, you're going to be killed. And I said, no, nope, I'm not going. I'm not. So he immediately found another cardiologist from a friend that golfed with this cardiologist. He was older. And I went to him and we I got in by, you know, by the guy that helped us because he was a personal friend. He said, this is a real dear friend of mine and this is his wife. And I mean, I came in and I remember him standing there and he said, well, what's happened to you? And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to tell me, you know, and I'm going to give him down the road because he's going to try to tell me. Uh, I said, well, I've had a near death experience and nobody wants to listen to me. And he said, well, what do you want to call it? I said, I want to call it miraculously healed. He said, I'm going to call it with you. And he was the, uh, he was perfect. He gave me such faith in what had happened. He said, I've seen it. He said, and he would say, only time you're going to come in is once a year on your birthday, if it is alive, you know, if you can. And I only want to see you once a year. And he's, but only on your birthday. So when he, I would come in, he would have a, a I guess it would be um, people, he was, his staff that he was training, or he had um, uh, other doctors that he was training, cardiologists, and he would have them all line up and said, she's coming in here to do something, and I want you to look at her records, please. And they're like this, they're going, now I don't have any blue lips, I don't know, have oxygen. He said, yep, that's right, you're reading it. She had the big one. She had the big one like that. And then I got in and I would do the isotope and everything. And they would see me doing it. And he turned around and he said, let me tell you something. Yes, you're a doctor, but you better remember God is first. And that's why I used to come in once a year for his uh, patients would see me. And they, they, I got to be really popular because they were glad to see me because I was truly a miraculous. He said, you're miraculous to be able to do what you've done and then come out of it. But then to have another one, you know, many years later, but also just to have the experiences that I've had, you know, two drownings, you know, two, two strokes, go two through, heart attacks. Go through the next, the next interesting uh, experience you had. Well, that was pretty intense, that one, but I had for five years, I was with my family and I saw everything. Jesus came to see me. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with Jesus, but Jesus came to me for 18 months after that near death experience. After I left my school, I was told one day I was driving to work to go to teach and spirit said, you need to quit your job today. And I did. Now, I did continue to finish the year, but I told them if I went off, you better give me off. Yeah, I mean, and I, w I did not do anything. I mean, they were just glad that I even came back because I had over 300 and something uh, sick days. I could have walked in, out that day and they and I was with a private school, a Catholic school. They would have had to pay another teacher plus me. And I told them I'm not going to do that to you. I uh, said, but you're going to call. You're going to let me off when I need to be off. And I used to say I want a week off. And I, they were, I mean, it was a great last year for me because I didn't have to do anything. They were just glad of showing up, you know. But that's when I really realized I could see things. I've always been able to see aura all my life. Um, I thought everybody could see it. I, you know, I didn't know. I remember one day I was in the uh, teacher's lounge and I said, do you see all the light that comes off those kids when it all lights up, the whole room lights up, then you know everybody's got the concept and, you, and they're all just sitting there eating there. <laughs> and they said, only you can see that. 
You see how they can process. We can't see that. I said, you don't see how they move back and forth through their brain to see how it kept. They went, no. They said, Jen, we don't see any of that. I said, I always thought everybody saw it. So then I realized my last year, I thought, I'm going to teach children how to see their aura. So I would stand up in a white, uh, white screen and I would say, what do you see? Oh, that's yellow. That's so I taught them how to do aura and how to do electromagnetic fields. I was talking electromagnetic field in the 80s and then uh, 90s, and nobody even knew what I was talking about most of the time back then. So now it's a very common thing to say electromagnetic. And uh, but just to have the experience of what I've had and seen with kids and I've seen kids come in. Well, our neighbor, my neighbor, I'm back into my hometown, uh, my home, uh, home, uh, my mom and dad's home. And I live on Angel Avenue. And when I'm doing a motivational speaking, they said she lives on Angel Avenue. <laughs> and I think. Yes, but my next door neighbor who is in her 90s, she's seen me ever since I've been a little girl. And she says, I see them come into your house in crutches and wheelchairs. And when they come out, they walk their crutches back and they don't need a wheelchair. What are you doing in that house? And I just said, I'm just working with people's energy fields. So I got very good at it and I became very good about it because I taught myself. I listened to my body. My body talked to me. My soul talked to me. There was an inner voice that told me how to do this, how to go over when I had my uh, big stroke and I was with a client when she saw it. She saw me go out of my body. She saw me come back in my body. She saw me look up, up in the roof because I thought I'd been hit by lightning out of the roof. And it rang my bell. It took me almost two hours to just be able to come back into my body. And, um, and it took me a year to put it to back together. But you gotta understand, I'm dyslexic. So I have always taught myself how to go the opposite of my brain because being dyslexic, you do opposite of everything. So I've been teaching children that I didn't even know what dyslexic was until I was 53 years old. And a friend of mine that's a teacher she said, I think you're dyslexic. I said, do you think that was the problem? Because I'll flick, you know, flip things over. And she said, yeah, but after I had the stroke, it was really complicated because I'd, I'd have it reversed. I couldn't do typing. I had to teach myself all over again. And no, I did not go to the hospital. Everybody gets freaked out, but I would never tell anyone to do it unless they've done the deep inner work that I've done with my body. It takes a lot to work with the energy and the electricity and the magnetism in your body to be able to do that. You can't just, I've been doing it for 25 years. So go go to your big NDE. The big one? The one that you talked about on Jeff's show. You mean the one that, uh, that was the uh, major heart attack in 19, uh, 1998. Through that experience. Yeah. Well, how that, that was the first week, like I said, and then when I was set, well, I, what happened is that was the first day of spring, summer. It was the summer. Yeah, it was summer. June the 2nd, 1998. And I was in my classroom with my son and two of the girls that were coming into doing the, um, you know, the bulletin boards. We were pulling it all down for the summer. But I kept having this really strong chest pain. I thought it was, you know, gas or, and because the week before, I ended up having to call in an ambulance while I was at school because I thought I was having a heart attack, but it was acid reflux. So, I just, you know, that, and I remember that nurse when I, that happened, I said, um, I just not going to ever come back because he said, you'll think you're having a heart attack every time, but you'll come in, you know, and I thought, and I was really, really bad about, I don't like embarrassment. I had to come back in and say, it's the same damn thing. So I said, I'm never going back there. So here I'm having a major heart attack, trying not to say, well, it's acid reflux. So I family go in uh, to the secretary at the school. Now, the kids are up there. And I said, you know, Mary, I think there's something really going on here. I think I might have an acid reflux. She said, she said, yeah, I think we better call Ron. You know, I called my son and we'll get him to come and get you and we'll just leave the car at the, ha you know, at the school. 
And he, I said, well, we'll pick it up later. And I remember my son called me, I came and got me with my other son and I emptied out some stuff. But the thing that really got me, what made me go down in the first place is I was bending over the trash uh, can and my, I bent down to pick something up and I just had pers perspiration is just dropping off my face. I've never seen any, and I thought, and it was like, it was just water and, and I thought, that is really different. What in the world is happening to me? This is really getting me. That's why I went down to tell Mary, you need to call Brian. And so I got into the, uh, you know, to the house and I'm still having a little bit of, uh, it was hard. I mean, I was having a hard time breathing. And I thought, well, I've either made a muscle. I've probably gotten a muscle. So I went up to the third uh, room, floor and I'm laying down in my cat's are just staring at me, like really staring at me. And I think that is really odd while they're staring. I thought, well, maybe I need just to go down and see if that's my shoulder. And we had a, a hot tub. We had a nice house. We had not, you know, it was. So I, I got into the hot tub thinking that will release this. I didn't even get in probably to the kneecaps and I proceeded myself to go outside and start vomiting. And I said, now that is exactly what you would be doing with your heart attacks. That's what, I mean, I know the symptoms. So I thought, no, then I thought, no, I'm going to go back up on the third floor. And I got back in the floor, you know, on the on the bed and I'm laying there and the cats are still going. And this time they're really just looking at me and I'm thinking that is not normal. There's something not there. There's feeling something. And then a small voice says, go into the mirror and look at yourself. When I walked into my bathroom, I looked in the mirror and my eyes were already rolling back and I was ashen gray. I already knew I'm in the process of dying and because I have seen death. So I ran down to the uh, downstairs because my husband was calling the doctor to get some more acid reflux. And I said, I don't need that. I need to go straight to the emergency room now. And he started arguing. I said, I need to go now. And so he said, OK, OK. So we got in there. Now he is still thinking the same thing I'm thinking. So I remember he drops me off in the front. He said, I'll park. You just walk in. Now I walk in and I'm like this. I think I'm having acid reflux. But the little girl on the receptionist, she looks at me and she said, walk right on in. And I thought, see, they recognized me because I'm from this town. They knew who I was. So that's why they wanted me. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, it's because I'm so special. No, it was because I'm having a massive heart attack and that woman recognized it. When I got into on the table, the woman there was a nurse, but I went to school with her. Her name was uh, Janet, but we called her Punky. And she said, Jenny, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. And she said, you just need to lay down, just lay down. And I kept thinking, I am laying down. Am I acting weird? Next thing I know, I'm inside my body, but I'm looking at my solar plexus and I'm seeing all of them going, there's something not going on. There's some, there's a lot of energy going on. And I wouldn't have said energy back then. I would never. I said, there's something not right. But they gave me that same solution for my acid reflux. And I remember, and it felt so good when it went down, but when it came back up, it hit the wall and it flew out of my mouth. And they said, this is a heart attack. You know? And I went, did they say heart? And as soon as when they said there's a heart attack, I went back down in my body and there was, I could see, I could see, I could see through my body, part of me over there, part of me over there. And I'm thinking, it's not making sense. It just doesn't make sense. And then the next thing I know, I was back into my body and there was somebody in there with me, holding me real tight and say, be still. Shh, be still. And I'm going, am I frailing out there? Am I acting weird out there? And it's the same. I mean, really pull me in. Say, Shh, be quiet. Be quiet. And I thought, who is that in there talking? You know, I'm trying to find out who it is. And uh, the next thing, I'm out of my body again. 
And um, I remember I got back in because the nun came in and I recognized uh, Marcia in. And I thought it was going to be my husband and he was going to get the boys. And she said, I'll go with her. And I thought, she's going with me? Why did she here in the first place? She's very intuitive. She called and my sons told her that I was at the ER. She said, something told her, go to the ER now with Jenny. And so she rode with me. Thank God she did because she prayed for me. Um, she prayed for me to come back. And she had already known pretty much that I was gone. She knew that there was a part of me that was still there, but there was a part of me that wasn't. Now, I didn't know this until many, uh, year, well, probably about eight or nine months later, because I wouldn't talk to it, anybody about it. But I remember thinking, what if they turned all the lights out in the ambulance? Because they're not seeing my, you know, they need to see everything. I need to check my blood pressure. Why are they not doing that? Well, the next thing I know, I'm riding next to the ambulance. I said, that is not possible. I cannot be riding with this ambulance. And then I could put my head in the ambulance and ride with it, and I could see me in there. And then I'd come back and I thought, what is, I was really confused because I remember riding really up closer to the driver, and I went like that, and he turned around, looked at me, and, he, and he, I said, there's no way I can drive next to this guy. But it was just, it was a profound experience. And I remember when I drove in, as soon as we hit the, like the road into the Amlet or the ER, it jerked me enough to where I came back on the, and I felt like I was in the table anyway. But when they pulled me out of the, to the gurney and I landed on that, you know, cause they, those legs come down and it jarred me, really jarred me. And it was like, I'm back in my body. And it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I can feel everything. It was like, what happened? Why, you know, but I remember as I was riding, I could look up and I said, this is ER, just like the TV, ER, because you could see that somebody was riding in the gurney. And that is just like ER. Then I got in and my friends, everybody, all the teachers that were with me, they met me up there. Now, my husband's trying to find the kids, gather the two boys up. And they look at me and they said, how are you feeling? And I, it was so much pain. It was like the anaconda was wrapped around with an elephant sitting on it. And, I, and I, I wouldn't talk much because it hurt. But I remember them looking. So we did the one eye is for yes and two eyes, you know, cl close my eyes is no. And so they would talk to me that way. But then... The nurse came in and said, we're going to let her go. And you all said goodbye, what you need to. And I remember saying, this is it. These are going to be the last people that I'm going to say goodbye. I mean, it really, that was like a boom. Like, I'm not going to see my children. And I'm not going to say goodbye to my husband. And I remember as I'm rolling in, that was a quick feeling. But when I got back on the table, then my, already, uh, my, my cardiologist came in and he starts talking to me. He's young and he's doing gloves. You know, he's talking, well, what happened to you? You know, he's trying to talk. And I'm thinking, I cannot believe you're even being this jovial. I'm sitting here on a table. And, you know, you still have these kind of thoughts. And then he's the one that bent down and I saw the pen. But I saw him drop it out of his pocket. And I thought, well, they'll better get that up. But I didn't know anything about his shoes until I started coming out of my body when they did the operation on me. I mean, it, I saw all of it. I mean, they put up uh, like a screen so I could see it. But every time it would go buzz, I would go out of my body and come back in. And I thought, that is really weird. But I remember I went down and I saw his shoes and I thought, he's got Kohan shoes, no booties. And that's when I knew that I thought, I'm going to have to pay for that. If I if he gets anything off of them, that's what you're thinking. So I remember asking that when I came, but I was very fogged when I first came out. I thought that, you know, the priest was there and he didn't give me the last rites. He gave me the rights of the sick. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. I'm not dead. <laughs> but there was a lot of commotion going on in the hall, uh, hallway because our priest didn't come. It was a priest that came in from Lexington, which I knew Father felt more, but 
uh, everybody's really upset. You could see there was a lot of uh, um, chaos over that end, but I was just very calm. And then everything settled down. Everybody came over to see, you know, they were all looking at me. And But I wasn't talking much because I was just confused about everything. But that night is when it all happens uh, with the uh, angels and Archangel Michael and the lady in there. I mean, it was like chaos going on in there. And then I had the nurse come and she was going to take me to the treadmill and I'm thinking they're going to kill me. But I remember when I walked out on the third day, I was like, I'm back and I'm not going to ever go back through that. And for three months, I was off of, uh, for summer break, and I didn't talk. I didn't. Uh, my family thought that something had happened to me. That, in fact, my husband at the time said, "I want you to go back to the hospital, and I want you to retrieve yourself back, because I don't recognize who you are here. Who are you? What do you mean? Who am I? I am me." He said, don't, you don't act like you, you're not talking like you. And I said, I am like me. And, you know, and I couldn't understand what he meant because I just wasn't the same. I didn't have the same take. I didn't have this. I mean, everything was talking, everything. The bugs talked, the birds talked, the dogs talked, which I had communicated with animals all my life, but never like that. And I had profound experiences uh, during that time, too. I had an angel room uh, that my husband had built for me. And I was standing looking at the uh, dusk of the sunshine, you know, sunlight coming down in dusk and sun, the sun setting. And, and there was a beautiful voice that came up behind me and said, I painted that for you. And I knew that. I knew that is very true from the, the love of God and the eyes of God, because everybody's going to see that sunset with a different perspective, even though we all think we see the same, but we still see a different perspective. And I thought that is the most amazing thing. That's exactly how God, he, I painted that for you. And I thought, oh, my God, I was missing the mark all the way it wasn't like that. When you really are alive inside and you see with the eyes of God, and that's what I would pretty much call it, it's alive. It was the colors were different. Everything was different. My whole life was different, but I was still living with my family that was very unawake and would say things mean to me that, you know, do you think do you think you're Jesus, mom? And I would say, Yeah. I think I'm Jesus. I think I can be like Jesus. I remember that. And they thought my my husband would do this. He'd say, you're, you're a devil. You, you know, and I wasn't. I just recognize that there's a lot more going on in this world than what we think. And I then I took five years to be with my family. And one night I was under domestic violence there. And um I didn't realize it was that. It was more emotional. It was never physical, but my older son was getting ready to hit me, and the back door opened up, and the voice of God said, you need to leave now, and don't look back, because they want to harm you, and I got in the car, and I went away. I lived in people's, uh, off their couches. I, I lived very, until my, I could get my house, this house, uh, remodeled because I had people in here that was, uh, they were renters and I got them out. So, but I had a lawyer that was fabulous. Uh, I ended up being uh, a profiler for him and I didn't have to pay for that divorce. After all, I got amazing things happened during that time. And uh, my business got started at the age of 50 and, and it's been successful ever since. So really, all of that that happened to me was perfect for me. I just had to get out of my own way. I don't know how to follow all that. <laughs> um, so what of all the interesting things that happened to you in your life, which ones have you not discussed yet? 
the one I, the last mine, last heart attack was because of my ex-husband. He died. And my ex-husband uh, had been molested by a priest. And I found out about a year ha after my NDE. And I was in the toilet, and this is true. I did not know. I've been married for 27 years. I had no idea. I'm a psychiatric social worker with background in sexual abuse. And um, I realized something was going on. I remember I was in the toilet and this guy, this this uh, Catholic a priest came into my bathroom. And I thought, who is this? You know, I was having profound experiences. So, you know, it was like, uh, who are you? And he said, well, my name is Father Wood. And I knew about Father Wood. I knew that Ron had known about him. And um and I thought, OK, and he and he said, I can't move over. I can't move on because uh, Ron hasn't forgiven me. I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea. And he showed me what he did and it took me backwards. And I thought, oh, my, this is big. This is bigger than I even. And he um, he said that I, I can't move on. And I said, you can't move on because you haven't moved up to God. You need to go to God. I don't know how anybody could forgive you. You've got to go for the goodness of God. So the next thing I know, he asked me, he said, would you help me? And I said, I'm not helping you because my family at that time thought I was crazy because the grass was talking. The bees were talking. I mean, we had a farm. I told my husband at the time, I said, you don't really have to grow any. Uh he approached you. He was, he was already on the other side. You couldn't yeah. cross over. You told him. Um, I told him, I said, you need to go to God. I said, Ron, right, go yeah. ahead, go from there. And so he kept saying, you need to help me. And I said, I'm not going in there to help you because they already think I'm crazy. They have. My family was thinking about having me committed and I could feel that. And I mean, I could hear them I, when you after this near death experience, I could hear everything. I could hear what people were thinking. I couldn't go into a restaurant without being indicted with all of the, you know, people. I, it was very I was very sensitive to sound. So I told him, I said, I can't do that. So uh, he said, I will show you something that will help you. And I thought, well, what are you going to show me? You're over on the other side. So. That next, that I think it was the next Sunday. I know it was the Sunday. I just, I wasn't, at the time when I came out of my near-death experience, I did not have electricity around me. I could not get around cell phones. It bothered me. I was taking the batteries out of the remote uh, for the TVs. I mean, I was having a very difficult time with electricity. And my higher self or the my small voice said, you got to take all the electricity. I had to be in a room that had no electricity because it bothered me so badly. And I thought I was crazy at that time because I thought I could feel all the wires out of the electricity. I called the uh, KU uh, people over several times saying there's some light, you know, uh, le electrical things are falling apart out there. I, you know, I said the wires are not catching everything and they're looking at me like I'm crazy and no it's because it really does happen you're so electrical that you can feel it all so what happened was that Sunday right after that a priest I went and got the paper which I hadn't been reading the paper at that time because the paper would upset me with people with the, uh, bad you know with bad events it would upset me so bad I'd have to go and lay down because it would upset me so bad so I wasn't looking at newspapers I wasn't looking at TV because it was too uh, sensitive to it and I remember I got the Sunday paper and I picked it up went to the bathroom just wanted to sit there and opened it up and I went straight to this little bitty teeny weeny. And it was talking about three lawyers that were getting ready to sue two priests. One of them was Father Wood. And I went, whoa, for abuse, sexual abuse. I flipped that around and I walked over to my husband and I said, you need to read that. And I remember he went into a trance and that's what it looked like. He got up, he went to the living room where our computer was and he typed a, a five page letter 
of what happened to him from the age of 10 to his being 16. And when he gave it to me, I sit there and I thought, oh my God, this priest was a pedophile. He was grooming these young. So what we did is we took it to court and we won. And uh, in fact, there was, I think it was 242 victims in that uh, lawsuit. And um, I ended up working with several of those students or those people, those victims by accident. When they would come here and work with me, they would find out that I was the one that helped sue the, the church. And they were like, you did that? I said, yeah, we did it. We're the ones that created it because my husband's mother had all the pictures with the priest, had everything that she ever, he saved everything. So we had hotels where he'd been, all of it. So they needed all of that information. So that all went to uh, to sue them. And we did. Now, my husband did get, I think, $100,000. I asked him about that right before he died because it was so closed. It was a closed meeting. And, and I said, you sold yourself for $100,000. That's all I kept saying is, and he didn't want to talk about it. He did. He didn't want to see anything about it. And I said, you know, Ron, I just, I'm shocked that we should have done a lot more because, and I couldn't get involved in it because they held me out. So my lawyers could be only going in there with him and whatever. But I, I ended up meeting, this is my quest on this plane is to break that the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, any place that is going to be acting like they're godly and do that to our children, I have a quest on it. I will find out. And when I do, I mean, I'll go right to them and tell them that I know what the truth is. I went over to the priest over at our uh, our little church the other day and called him out. I said, you can't do this. And he knows now why is because of what I had to witness with my husband at the time. And and both of my boys had been molested as well. They were molested by my next door neighbor. I was molested by a friend. So it was a theme of molestation in there. And that is something that you came in here together as a cell family to work it out somehow. Um, and I saw that. I saw that through that near-death experience, several of them, that we have such an opportunity here to change everything here. It's not as bad as it appears to be. It's very simple, but we are so caught up in our programs of what we have been told, not necessarily the truth. We have to learn how to find that within ourselves. And that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. So uh, let me try to do this without closing it again. All right. I thought that's what I did before, but uh, I may have hit the X. I don't know. Anyway, um, so you've had your NDE. You've uh, you were just talking about a priest who was a molester that you you didn't you sort of started that story, but you didn't quite finish it. When you meet, that, that's where I think we got caught when I was talking to you about it. I know, but you you continued on the story, but you kind of uh, you you went down the road of pursuing justice uh, over what you did with the actual priest who had gone on the other side. Yes. And so what what did he show you? Um, what he did to my. Oh, yeah, he showed you that. Yeah, he okay. showed me. after he showed you that, then what happened between you yeah. and him? Well, I told him, I said, you need to go to God. That You're not going to be forgiven. And he left. Yes, he left. He did, the last thing he said to me. Okay, he, so you did help him cross over by telling yeah. him to go to God. Yeah, I did. I said, you need to go clear yourself right now because nobody's going to, not anybody on this plane can save you or forgive you. That's between you and God. And uh, but he did say before he left, he said, I'm going to give you something. And that was that Sunday paper that I opened it up and it was the three lawyers. OK. All right. So um, what other 
interesting things have happened to you that you would like to discuss? Well, I got to see the movie Spotlight, and it is about the Boston bishop uh, when he got caught, he let all the pedophile uh, priests go in Boston, and they went to the Vatican. Now, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is how I know God works. I'm sitting on a plane getting ready to go into Florida because I was a motivational speaker, and this woman kept appearing in the audience or, you know, ready to go to the plane. I kept thinking, who is she? She would pop out in here. She'd be over there. And I think, who is that woman? And because I, I watch things like that, things that pop in, you take a note. You know, if I see things three different times, it's the same person or I'm going to take a note. And that's what I say. Take a note, watch this, see what's going on. Was that woman ended up sitting with me on the airplane? And she was the first cousin of the Bishop of Boston, first cousin. And I told, I was started telling her because I was speaking. I wasn't going to say anything. And Spirit said, talk to her, talk to her. And I said, okay. Uh, I started talking to her and I started telling her about my ex-husband, what happened to him. And she looked at me and she said, that's my first cousin, Boston, the the Bishop of Boston, and his last name is Law. His last name is Law. She said, and we hate him for what he's done to our church. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is the main dude that was on Spotlight. And it is a movie. It's it's a very interesting movie. What the reporters found out, they were all Catholics. They had to see what that went on. And uh, she and I talked about it. And she said, I'm never going back to church. I said, don't let him stop you from going to God. Then they win. And um, she uh, took my card and I never saw her again. But she said, this was a divine intervention and you have given me more hope than anybody else. And that's how I ended that conversation with her. Um, that's what I'm saying. That's my life. That's If I did ever write a book, and I'm not going to write a book, it would have been called uh, Plain Stories, P-L-A-N-E. I had more plain stories just being on a plane with people and talking to them. And then, and Spirit saying, talk to them. So when did you first start working to heal people? What age were you? How long, how long ago was that? 40, uh, I was 48. Okay, and you're 72 now, so. Uh -huh. I've been doing it for about 25 years. Okay, so. Um, of all the, how many people do you feel you've helped heal? Hundreds. Okay, and of all those people, um, are there are there healing uh, experiences that you that if you said which one, if someone said, uh, tell us the most miraculous, interesting healing experiences you've worked with and your clients without saying who they are, mm -hmm. which ones would you bring up? I think the one, I've got several, but the one that, and on Jeff's, there's two of my uh, friends are on there and they talk about what, ha what I worked with them on that. But the one that I remember the most, that's the fun one is he was from New Zealand and he got bit by a copper head at uh, at Red River Gorge is where we and he has never been around a snake like that and they had to helicopter him back in to Lexington and everything and I met him at a, a dance I mean he was in crutches and his foot is black and I said that's not correct I said you you mean to tell me you've gone through everything and they didn't fix this and so I told him I said I can fix that he said, I don't think you can. I said, oh, yes, I can. I know I can. So he came over to visit me. Now, he came in crutches, crutches. And um, I sat down with him. I said, you should know this because you came from New Zealand. And those are the end of Aborigines. They know how to do this. So what I did is I just started doing energy of uh, going through. I didn't touch him. I just pulled it out underneath his foot, and I pulled out all that darkness. And when he walked out, he walked out. And he said, how did you do this? I said, well, it's not that hard. I said, it's just energy. And so I just got that. 
that was one of them. And then another one, I, my oh, dear. Hold friend, on, hold on, stop. Back up. Okay. Go to the, go. Um, people like yourself, and when I say yourself, I could be speaking of anybody. Right. And, and all of my uh, interviewees, they start talking about some very interesting experience, and they fly through it in about ten seconds. And I'm like, stop. Go ahead, start over. Tell us the, tell, retell the story okay. as if you were there in the moment at, as it occurred. You said you pulled energy from... Out of his bottom of his foot. I knew how to do it. So you were not feeding I, him energy. You were pulling energy from him. Yeah, I, I let it come in. It's electromagnetic. I already knew how to do it. All I did is I activated the leg because it was in the leg. And, hold, on, no. hold on, stop. You activated the leg. What do you mean? You With activated? all of the frequency out of my hand. Okay, so you had energy. In my hands. Out of your hands. Your that cheek. I can create in my hands. Right, and you used the energy in your hands to Enough. start the flow of energy. Yes. Of his body flowing and to the, you. Out of the bottoms of his, or the bottom of his foot. It was, you know, setting up. And I just started, as soon as I grabbed it, it's thick, just like heavy. It feels like mud when you're first working through somebody. And I just started pulling. He said, you're killing. Yeah, it's coming through my spine. I feel that. I said, just take, and then I just jerked it real fast. And he, he went, <gasps> and then it just started running. It ran out. So basically you grabbed the negative energy that was dormant, that was stationary okay. within his body. It was holding the 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 uh, illness there. Yes, I just you, bite. Yeah, and you pulled pulled it as like it was as if it were a snake itself. Yeah, it was, and we felt it go through. I mean, you could feel the scales and everything like a snake. I mean, I can feel all of that. He was just just amazed, but I've seen that before. So when it when it, the energy came to you as it was as you were grabbed it and pull or pulling on it, how did it feel as it was flowing to you? It feels like water when it starts flowing right. When you get the uh, uh, energy of your body really in the true flow of the electrical current, it flows. You'll feel it. it's just like water running out of your hands. And I just that's when I knew it was cleared. And then I looked down and it was not black anymore. It was clear. He walked out. So when it was flow, when the negative energy was flowing to you, did it flow through you or how did no. it, where did it go? No, I place it to the earth because Mother Earth has to take that. That is her energy. So, and she claims that. I mean, that's how she talked to me. She said, give me everything. That is my fertilizer. That is mine. You all were holding back a lot of stuff that I need to clean. And she talked to me. She always talked to you me. You call her Gaia? No, nope, I don't call. I no, I didn't call her anything like that. I nope, called. She doesn't her. have a name. No, nope, she She's does not have a Mother name. Earth. I just knew. She let. I laid. Now this happened after my NDE. I mean, I, she said, "Why don't you learn to lay with me?" And I took a quilt and I went out to the far, you know, the pond, basically, and I laid down and I could feel her and I laid back on her and. She was breathing through me and she I could breathe with her. And she said, let me show you something. Then her whole breath just opened up everything in the world. And I could tap the sky and it would go foo, 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 foo. Amazing. It's amazing work when you're working with that. Okay, give us another one and don't don't fly through it if it's interesting. <laughs> go slow. Well, okay. This one was about a dear friend and she'd had Several, uh, her feet had, uh, she had bunions uh, bunions on them, and one, and they had to have an operation on it. She's had three operations on it, and it never did work, and she could hardly walk. And I said, why don't you come over and let me see you? And and she did energy work, too. She she knew Reiki, and I said, come over, and you, you work inside of yourself, and I'll work on the outside, and we'll create a currency, a current, 
currency, a current to where we can build this to possibly change this. Well, we did it. Her foot, I mean, I'm on the outside and I felt I saw the electrical current come out of my hand into her ankle and she said, wow, I feel that. And the next thing we saw is her entire foot, we're not touching. She's in her mind in her body. I'm outside of her body about, you know, pretty about that far out. And her foot starts doing its own thing. And it literally changed itself and moved around, melted in, and then it reconnected itself. And she's never had a problem since. What was her original problem? It was she'd had three operations on that foot and she never could get it to go. You know, she was a walker and she said it just hurts. And she's gone to her, uh, the doctors that did it. They said, there's nothing we can do. I said, and I said, I don't believe that. I said, there's something not right. So all we did is we realigned it on a higher level of consciousness. And it did it on its own. I didn't do it, but I've seen that done before. So she, what was her problem? She had, um, I she know she had surgeries, but it was. A bunion, started a bunion. out as a bunion. And that was a botched number. And then, you know, she was walking on it incorrectly anyway. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And she called me and she said, I can't walk hardly. And I said, come over here and let's just see what we can do. And she's worked with me before and she said, and sure enough, that's what happened. It did its own way. So we provided you, the energy. So do you remember the very first client you ever uh, worked with? Yes. As a healer? What, tell yeah. us that story. <laughs> or actually, before you tell that story, <laughs> tell us why you felt like you could do this work to begin with. Because what, I, what, I, what got you into it first before you started? Because I went in myself. So, I, I, I helped myself. I was given the direction how to go in. This is what I was trained to do. It says, when you get ready, because I was told that you need to meditate. I didn't know anything about meditating. I didn't know how to keep my mind empty. I didn't know how to do any of that. I remember for six months, I laid in my bed going, Oh my God, those are cobwebs. Oh, I can't believe I'm, why did my housekeeper don't do that? That's what I was doing, you know? And then I go, no, 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 come back in, come back in. Let's just breathe. But one day there was a voice that said, anytime that you are gonna go in, make sure you check your clock. I thought, why would I need to check my clock? But I did. And I remember I went down into my mind. It was like I meant imaginary. I drove, I, you know, cause I'm a diver. I dove into the top of my head and I just kind of went down into my body. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm laying in there. And I thought, wow, there's a lot to this. I mean, there was more. And I kept thinking, wow, that is really different. And I was going in, I could feel things all around it. And uh, gosh, I'm sorry. And uh, so I just was in there. And I remember coming back out of that and I'd been gone for almost two hours. I said, where was I? I was here, but where was I? So after that, I started doing it more and more. And it got to the point in the first two years, I was doing 16, 17, 18 hours a day in meditation, just going in like that, going down and staying to my bottom of my feet. Everything in your body is holding everything about you. That's why you've got a frame. That's why you've got a body. That body has everything that you have gone through, your soul has gone through. So all your traumas, everything is in there. So I just got to learn how to work through my trauma and how to use it energetically to heal. That's how I did it. And then I taught myself and then I taught others. So you meditated, right? Yeah. So, so tell us about your meditation. You said that you went to your feet. Well, no, I didn't go. Not at the beginning. I, what I did is, I, well, I was told you need to get Oso. Are you under, are familiar with Oso? Oso is, he's a meditator. And I said, uh, I don't know anything about that. 
But within two or three days, when I was given that information, somebody came in with a book from this man with these three different meditations. You had beginning meditations, you had me, uh, medium uh, meditations, and you have intense ones. And I thought, I cannot believe that. Somebody just comes up and says it. Because when you're in that realm, all you do is ask, and things start coming back to you. I mean, I didn't have to do a whole lot. All I had to do is ask if that is in my divine plan. And so I had started reading these meditations, and I thought, oh, well, the first one was you pretend like you're sitting with a tree, an oak tree. They always say an oak tree, and then you lean back up against the oak tree, and you're sitting on a hill, and there's a whole lot of cars in front of you down in the highway, and you're just you're just viewing it. And it says, you're going to see blue ones, green ones, white ones, all, but don't pay any attention. Just let them go by. And then I thought, wow, that's kind of. And what it really is, is your thoughts. And when you don't pay any more attention to your thoughts, you empty your mind. And I started seeing, oh, that's how it works. So the more I could empty my mind of anything around me, the more I could go in deeper into my body to understand it even more. But all of that clutter kept you from going into your body to find out who you really are. So I learned how to empty it like that. So you learn to empty your mind. Mm -hmm. And once you learn to empty your mind, you realized you were spending a lot of time within that, myself. Okay. And and breathing, uh, learning how to breathe correctly. And how long did you do uh, focus on the meditations? Sometimes 16, 17, 18 hours a day. I know, I know but over, over what period of your life did you focus exclusively on your meditation? About the first five years. For five years? Yes. Okay. And then how did that end up leading you into doing healing work? Well, that right there was, I knew I could heal myself. I mean, well, I knew. Because you, the fact that, okay, so give us an idea of how you healed as in, we, I know the way you meditated. You went from many thoughts to few thoughts. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could if you're in an elevator with somebody and they said, tell me how you healed yourself before we get to this, before I get off the elevator, how would you explain uh, that whole process from uh, many thoughts to a few thoughts to actually fully healing yourself? What, what was the transition of going, getting to the point where you had no thoughts from there to when you were fully healed? that space between no thoughts and fully healed, what happened in that space in a very short few words? How would you describe all that? Well, it's stillness. When you learn to listen within, the stillness is so uh, massive, it's loud, your body talks to you. My organs would talk to me. They would tell me what I would like. For my heart attack, what I was trying to do is heal my heart. And I, I was really mad at my heart. I was 46 years old. And I said, you almost, and I was laying inside of me. Like, uh, it's almost like you feel like you're laying in a casket inside of your own self. And I was really mad at my heart. And I leaned around to look at my heart. And I said, you almost killed me. And it's, I didn't mean to kill you. I was trying to hide everything so you wouldn't see it. And I said, but you almost killed me. And it said, I almost killed you? But it, then all of a sudden, I said, give it to me. And it was like a ticker, you know, tickets that you get from a bay, uh, about a butcher. You know, they have those tickets that you can get from the butcher. And it just started pulling all these tapes out of me. I mean, it was like, and it was just rattling everywhere. It was like all of, and my body was moving and everything. It was just everywhere. And I, and I remember going, <gasps> and it says, I'm so sorry. I betrayed you. And I said, you didn't betray me. You just were holding on incorrectly. And I mean, remember taking a breath through my heart for the first time. I went, <gasps> and I could feel the breath through my heart. It, totally different. I mean, the work that I'm doing is I teach people how to really breathe. I had to practice breath work because 
I could only breathe through up here. I had to learn how to breathe all the way through my entire body and take that breath all the way down into the earth. And she would hold on and anger me into the earth. But then I could jump, I mean, push up from her, anchored, come back up, come back up here, and I'd expand up here, and I would be white light. I knew how to do it. And I practiced a lot. <laughs> so, okay, so you uh, went from many thoughts to no thoughts. That's the silence helped you. You started talking to different parts of your body, including your heart, that almost uh, killed me. Well, I mean, you realize you're indestructible, so yeah. it didn't almost kill you. It almost took you from this body to, to another, where, yeah. to where you will go at some point anyway. Right. So, um, since you never actually die, it just almost took your physical life. Yes. As opposed to your eternal life. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, so you talk to your heart. You talk to different parts of your body. What are the parts, parts of your body were memorable besides your heart? Well, that's when I got to, into healing is because I could look into people's bodies and I would say, your uh, gallbladder doesn't like corn and you're eating fresh corn and it says it's hurting you. And they would look at me and they said, how do you know that? That's because your gallbladder just told me. <laughs> it would freak them out because they said, I do like fresh corn. I said, yeah, and you got to stop it because the gallbladder is getting ready to blow if you don't. You know, I, I at my very beginnings is I was I could go through the body and I could tell you exactly what every organ, why they were the way they were, why they were talking about me to that person. And one guy that came in, he was having an affair. And I said, you're having an affair. And I said, Be and these people that were with me said, you don't do that. I said, yes, you do. I said, this is his toxic, and he is not honoring himself, and that guy never wanted to, would come back to <laughs> work with us, because he knew that we, could, we I found you out. I mean, I was brand new in this, but I was seeing it, and it, a lot of people were afraid of me at first. So what, okay, so you healed yourself, and you knew you could heal others, but what pushed you to actually take on your first client? This came in, uh, I got a phone call from New York and a guy heard about me and there's no way that that guy could have heard me. I wasn't out. I wasn't working with anybody, but friends, a few friends. He heard about me for uh, suing the Catholic Church. He'd been abused by a church and he heard about me in New York. Don't ask me how. And I worked with him on his abuse and he understood why that had to happen to him so he could wake up. It wasn't to make, you know, to punish him for doing something. It was to wake him up. And when you have a connection of how the soul has to work, it's it's not the same as humans. It's that has got to do its work to get prepared for the next uh, coming in. And it, it's eternal so it's trying to figure it out as we it comes in here with us that is our soul but it has an eternal life and our vessel is just holding it and, okay so um the abused person found out about your about suit, the church <laughs> called you and and he said you need to work with me yeah, I need help. And and I, you and what part of you knew without any doubt? You could I knew help. exactly what to do. I knew exactly what to do because I'd been molested and I knew how I had to go through my abuse through that process of going in and looking at everything is not as a victim, but as an understanding of how this really works eternally. And um yeah, I showed him how to do it. I taught him how to breathe, and he was healed. So do you remember, okay, so um, you healed, you talked to your heart to heal that part of you, mm -hmm. and you s talked to other parts of you. So as a molested individual, 
how did you heal that part of yourself? I had to go into the areas that I've been molested. I had to go through where the man, uh, he, how he used his finger. How I had to go through all of the energy that has been placed in there and not be afraid. This is when I work with people that have been abused. You've got to go through that because that's in your body. You might have that in your mind. You might release it, but it's still in your body. And you're going to ha- it's going to reoccur because you haven't re- you know, addressed it. And I had to go through all of the emotions. I was a seven year old little girl. And I mean, he did not penetrate me or anything, but he scared me enough to where I knew it was something wrong that was going on. I was seven years old and it was a friend that I knew like so, a brother. So was it um, an emotion of shame? That you had to it was emotional shame. Uh, what he did is he showed me his penis. Uh, he said, you're going to get one of these one of these days. And I was so shocked because my father was never around me like that or anything. So, you know, you're kind of shocked. It throws it does. It knocks you into your lower lobe or the third eye. It 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 paralyzes it in a way. It was awful. So. Uh, I'm not asking you to go through what happened with the man who molested you i would like you to go back through the experience you had of the actual healing of that part of yourself well that Just, was what it was you, Is, but you talk how did how did you actually do it i yourself? laid in my body for almost 15 to 16 hours and i laid in it and i said show me where i have to release the energy that is in my body as a victim because everybody has that that's trauma uh, a good example is when i was i was in a motorcycle accident when i was 12. we hit rocks and it skidded now even to this day even if i'm in a car in that gravel sound i'll jerk because it's still in there about that uh, accident so when you learn that, then you know you're being triggered that it's in there. And so I just would find that's how I started working first with healing is helping with trauma and abuse and, and uh, uh, sexual abuse. So you talked to, so you, you spoke to your own body and you said, uh, show me mm-hmm. all the things that need to be released. Yes. And then your body showed you these things. Oh, I would rattle. I mean, it would be like ribbling off. I mean, you could feel it. It just in your body. So it would just start. It would just start releasing from you. Yes. Automatic. Because all you have to do is ask. Because it's waiting for you anyway to recognize that it even exists. If you don't think if, if if you're not aware of it, how can you change it? Most people are not even aware of it. And so. Is this the same one of the same techniques you work with in most of your clients? Yes. Higher frequency to get in. Yeah. Can they might stay with me for six or seven hours to get through it. Can you give us kind of take us through pretend that um, I or the audience is your patient? What that would you do? What would you do? Well, they'll be sitting in my couch. I've gone through the third. That's my fourth couch. Uh, they sit right across from me. And uh, first, I, I just get them into their eyes. I mean, I start just running energy through my eyes into their eyes. And they go, man, I can feel that. And then you'll see them go like this. And it's it's the same thing I do with animals as well, because they'll t- there'll be a tick and then you know you're in. And then I'll, and I'll say their eyes might go boom like that real fast. And I said, did you hear that? And I said, that is a connection within your higher consciousness that's helping you understand how to maneuver this. And then we might go through tears. We might go through anger. You know, we go through many phases of getting down into the depth of where that really is to find that. And I always call it it's a nugget. Uh, or a target, a target place, because that's when you want to find. That's where it is. So, and I would just keep dig- digging and digging until they go. Oh, I know what it is. 
and then it'll be totally nothing that you thought it would be. And um, and then they'll and they'll go, oh wow, and they'll shake off like, wow, that really knocked my head, you know. So first you start with an energetic connection. Yes. And then you go to an emotional. Well, it's usually energetic, but it drops you down into the emotional because there's layers and layers of the emotion. So that's what happens is it people don't want to go there because they're, it, it's painful. It hurts. Well, pain to me, pain is just past information. When you've got pain, it's trying to tell you something. But what we tend to do is we want to drink, you know, eat something or knock it out or what. No, pain is the most important thing you have because that is showing you where to start. It's a starting point. Then you travel, the pain will follow you and you go and follow the pain. And then you eventually, it, it took me some places right into the tip of my big toe. And that was when I was a little girl, I would wear flip flops and I know exactly what happened. And I would that flip flop would flip over and I would scrape the, my big toe and it would be painful for a little girl. And that would ring on my toe every time that something bad was going to happen. So I've learned how to listen to your body like, oh, that's something that I remember. So it's just you learn how to listen to your body and how it talks to you through pain, through hurt, through whatever you feel you've got to go in and because uh, it's a lot of this is programmed and we don't even know if it's really real or not you've got to find that within you so so um are there any other things that you wish to discuss before we end this and we can go as long as you want well i just I think what I do is pretty incredible, but it's any, if whatever I can do, you can do. I'm not doing anything special. I think we have, and I don't think they're gifts. I think we have natural abilities. We just have been programmed to think we don't. I mean, I know what I have inside of me. I know that it's a spirit within me and it's a very powerful being when it chooses it to be. So do you remember anything when you were out of your body beyond this earth? Did you go anywhere during any of your NDEs? Well, I went up into that room with the Council of Twelve. And uh, what's about that? Well, the Council of Twelve was quite different. Well, like I was riding by the ambulance before, and uh, it was like I had a a ponytail right here and it was like somebody jerked my ponytail and it jerked me up and I was up with 12 people in robes with golden robes uh and it was like where did I remember that's why that's why Jeff called me is because I said they asked do you have a body when you have an NDE and uh no, I didn't have a body but I knew I had a body I knew I was sitting on a chair and I knew I could I could feel my chair and I could feel my hands and it, but I couldn't see anything because you don't have any eyes. But you got to remember, you're going to remember what, what you had because I had not really moved out of my body enough to know that, that you could move. And I remember I was talking to me as is this my hands? What, what's going on? And they would laugh at me. They, they giggle. But you never could see their faces, ever. It was like, what? And it would feel like they might be in another room with you, but you're in the same room. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it makes sense. So I remember I would say something to myself, and they'd still hear me. And I think, are they laughing at me? And they giggle. And but everything was done telepathically. There's nothing. There's no faces. All I could see was the robes and the ropes. Uh, the the go ropes and I remember then there was something that said do you know you don't have to be here and it was like boom and I just went off and I just left and I traveled all around the universe and I now I proceeded to think that those were planets because I believed in planets at the time but I remember also 
turning around and there was a fence around the earth gated it was a gated fence and I thought how's that how's that work how do you get back in there bungee cords like patterns of bungee cords they bounced and you could dance on them so I had fun in there for a while I didn't I didn't want to come back and then there was a person that said all right you need to go back they need you and I remember saying to that being or that person because I didn't see a person I just heard a voice it said I'm going to go back and help my family well my family never did recoup from all of that I lost my children and my husband and I left my life that I knew very well in my farm and walked away and became this right so but okay so go back for a moment when you were, you just went through a whole bunch of um, you saw some twelve beings in robes. Yeah, they were called the twelve the council of twelve. They okay. told me who they were. And you heard when they said they were the council of twelve, it was um, telepathically you heard this. Yes, correct? everything. Everything. Okay. And what space were you in when you heard this? Mm-hmm. It was a room just like it had walls, but you could see through the walls. It was like a room. You knew that was a dimensional of room and it had walls, but you could see through the walls. I kept thinking, how can you see through that wall? And I couldn't put my hand through it, but it was just weird. But then when I said, would you know, you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have lungs because I kept thinking I don't think I'm going to be able to do this because I need to breathe and it, and then this small voice said you don't have any lungs and as soon as I heard that I was gone I took so, off. You weren't, so you weren't with the council of 12 very long no. no and you never saw their faces never their their faces were down well I don't even know if that was a face to be honest it was really beautiful robes like i said and golden uh ropes that's how it was tied and you knew it was it was gold you knew it was i don't know how i knew but i just knew the way it felt and and i couldn't have touched it because i wasn't over there by it but when you're in that state of mind anything is possible so where all did you go after you left them I went to the universe. I came back around to the earth and I went around and the earth was not a globe. <laughs> That's what I tried to, it wasn't globe. It was like, uh, it wasn't the same, but I had been trained to see or whatever. And I kept thinking, how can you have a fence in there? Why would they put a fence around that? You know, I, I was very, in, but I'm also curious. I'm very curious about where things are. Why did they do the things they did? So thank God I have curiosity because that's what saved me a lot of times. But I didn't have an understanding that way. You know, I just didn't knew it didn't make sense because, like I said, a lot of this doesn't come to you right away. You kind of have to you know, ponder it. I did a lot of pondering. Why would I think that? And then everything would kind of slow down and you I'd have a movie that would go in front of me like my third eye it would be a movie I thought well that makes perfectly good sense I just would have an understanding so where all did you go when you were traveling around the universe I was just in the universe I went to the stars I remember I knew I was a star one time because I remember it I remember I was a t- star and I felt. So you remember a life when you were a star? Yeah, I do remember when I was a star. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember I, any other past lives? Well, the only one that I have seen is, uh, and a lot of people hear the same thing, it's Archangel uh, in um, St. Joan. Um, uh, she came to me when I was young. Uh, St. Joan did. And I was I was starting to be a Catholic. I was at 16. I think I was in a beauty contest and she came in. Well, there was two things on that. You say St. Joan. Do you mean Joan of Arc? Joan of Arc. Yeah, okay. St. Joan. She was my saint when I became a Catholic. Okay. And I didn't know her like that. I met her when I was 15, 15 or 16. I was in a beauty contest and 
they said, living or dead, who would you want to be? And everybody in the 60s wanted to be Jackie Kennedy or those kind of people. And no, she kept saying, you want to be Joan. I thought, Joan who? And she said, Joan of Arc. And I went, Joan of Arc. I I remember thinking, what? You know, because, you know, that wasn't a pretty experience, I'm sure. So I remember when I the narrator asked me, I said, Joan, Joan of Arc. And he went, Joan of Arc. And he called me. And he said, Jenny, what's wrong with you? I said, because she died in what she believed in. And it came out of nowhere. I mean, it just rolled out of my mouth. And within the next two or three months, I ended up joining the Catholic Church. And that was my saint they gave me with St. Joan. And when you were traveling around the universe, picking up the fact that you were once a star, Mm -hmm. was there any memorable experiences that you had while you're out there? No, I just remember that I fell here to be a star. I mean, I wanted not to be a star. I wanted to come down to earth and I mean, I fell to earth. And I remember when I, I said, this is not going to be a pretty thing. And I just, it was like I unscrewed myself like a light bulb. It really was. And then I just fell to the earth. I remember it, but I don't remember any of the details with it. I just remember saying, oh, we're just star to uh, dust. I used to say that as a child. I, we were just stardust, mom. So are there any other interesting uh, experiences you've had that you wish to talk about before we end this? I had I had miraculous stories. I, Tell us any stories you want that you that you enjoy talking about the stories that you haven't mentioned, but that uh, make you feel good just because you recall them. Are there any things like that? Mm hmm. Well, yeah. One of the major ones that really touched my soul was one day I was sitting on my couch and I mean, I did a lot of meditation. I was just sitting there and I got up and I walked over to the center of my living room and I raised my hand. I said, I'm ready to speak for you. And it was very clear what I was saying. It was right on. And within the next week, I had my first uh, motivational speaker and they paid me a thousand dollars to come and speak. And I didn't do it. I just said, I'm ready to speak for you. I had a woman that was getting a new job and she needed a motivational speaker. She knew me personally. She knew that I'd been doing small little venues here and there. And she said, this is a big one. This is for the uh, state uh, government. And she said, we're paying you a thousand dollars. I said, absolutely. And I did a wonderful job with it. And uh it was amazing. I mean, that's been my life. And did you discuss all the things that I, we, we discussed in this conversation? No, 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 no. Not at the beginning. I talked about uh, who we really are, how to motivate you to be thinking about powerful words that you use instead of using the victim words. And I mean, I had a whole, uh, yeah, I had a wonderful presentation about that. I never did talk about this. I never did say anything about this until just recently about uh, flat earth or anything. I've never said anything. I've said it openly to clients and friends, but I've never done that like I did with uh, Jeff. It just rolled out of me. So So what else would you like to, uh, what other interesting experiences in your life? I think God is alive. I think God is live right now, this very moment. And I don't think, well, I had profound experiences with that. Like God came in one day at my house and went, G-O-D, goodness over doubt. Stop doubting yourself. And I thought, wow, that's true. We doubt ourselves all the time. So, I mean, I had profound experiences about that. Speaking okay. to me. Go on. What, what, what other, what interesting things to did you have that uh, happened to you that you haven't mentioned? Uh, Jesus wanted to tell me, he said, I'm going to take you somewhere. And he took me in a tornado. That sounds crazy. He took me in a tornado and I could look down. We were in the Middle East and I know exactly where it was. It was in uh, when Gaddafi was killed and uh, how they did the Gaddafi thing with the 
the government tore the, you know, they killed him and they destroyed his country. And I, I, and Jesus told me before, he said, you will not be a part of this. You will not get involved with this war. This is not one of yours. And I don't want you to think about it anymore. And it was like, wipe me out until one day I was sitting, I think I was standing in the grocery store and somebody said, isn't that awful about what happened, what we did to Gaddafi, what he's done? And I thought, who is that? Who, who are you talking about? And then I went back and reviewed it to look at what, well, that's what exactly what Jesus had told me was going to happen. He showed me and he showed me a lot of stuff like that. So you were told about Libya being liberated from Gaddafi. Yes. Well, but Gaddafi was now. not the bad guy. He wasn't the bad guy. I mean, God told me exactly what happened. He said that man was really a good man. He loved women. He not the way he wanted women to, you know, to be able to do what men can do. He gave he what the problem was with him is he because I started doing the research on it. I wanted to know what that meant. He was going to create his own currency. That's going to go. That was going to tell you know curtail into our oil money. They don't want that. Any country that ever goes against the government here about oil money and they're going to do their own currency, they'll stop it very quickly because we won't have the power of the money. So they they basically took his country away from him because he wanted to start. His he had pyramid. Yeah, he had pyramid and he had water and he had goat. So he had a lot of things. I mean, because I interviewed two of the uh, women there because I wanted to see if he was as bad as they said he was. That was a bad, bad RP job on him. He was not like that. And that's when I started getting into the government wasn't telling the whole truth. And then all I have to do is ask and people would show up that would want to talk to me about it. I got to meet some people in D.C. and um I got to meet some really important people that they thought they were important. And um, I know that they can use things in, like people like me in uh, D.C. They do it a lot. People like me. Well, um, what else would you like to discuss? Well, and I'm a remote viewer. That's helped me a lot. So I've I tried out the basic piece of remote viewing when Dr. Doom or Ed Dames mm -hmm. produced his first video of the series that he produced. Mm -hmm. I got a hold of that first video and a buddy and I successfully practiced the absolute basics of remote viewing, the first few steps that you do. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I'm, I'm, familiar, about the I'm familiar with the automatic writing portion of it. Yes, I'm uh, very good at that. Beyond that, I was never any good beyond the, the first automatic writing step. From that point forward, I, I never was, I couldn't get any of the rest of it. Well, I didn't go and get pra practice with it. I think I was always like that. I could always, I could fly when I was a little girl. I would tell my parents, oh man, I was flying all over the town. And I, they, I went into their windows. She said, you didn't go into somebody's window. You were here. I said, no. And I would tell her the things that I would hear from people. And, I, and then, you know, after you get kind of pushed down, my mother said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. My, I, would sca my, I scared my mom and dad a lot because I did a deja vu. I mean, we would go somewhere and I said, oh, we're going to meet this. And this girl's going to have a pony. And I... I and I think I'm going to end up going to ER. And my father would look at my mother and say, that's scary stuff. I don't know why she does that. But it would happen. Exactly what I said. So, so you were telling your future, your own future. Yeah, I was telling my, well, my family's future because we ended up in the ER. And it would freak my father out. He said, I don't want you to do that. You know, when I saw my father after he died, my mother said to me, because my mother was a lot like me. OK, she was scared of it. And I told her, I said, Daddy came through. Uh, I saw him, my father, when the, I, mean, I said he was died when I was 16. He walked right through our hallway and I was here by myself and scared me to death. I called her at work and I said, Daddy's back. She's what do you mean your father's back? And I said, 
he just walked through the hallway. And I mean, there's a creek on my uh, hallway. My father's the only one that could run that one because he was heavy. And every once in a while, some man or a person that's heavier will hit that, and I'll immediately look to see if that's my father. Yeah, it's a memory. So why did you bring up remote viewing? What what, what about remote viewing? Because uh, I think it's the most makes you thing. makes you. Uh, or what what about your remote viewing? Interest because I do you? healing that way. When I have I had a client at UK and um, she was very sick and she said I need your help and she saw me standing at my, her bed, me holding her hand and said. And she said, I looked at you and or I, I guess I looked at her. I don't remember this, but she said, you looked at me and said, you're going to be healed now. And then I walked out and she so said, you, I've seen you. You realize that's not remote viewing. That's astral projection. Well, that's astral projection, but also there is a remote viewing to it, too. So because I can walk through. I mean, if somebody needs something, they can't find something. I can be here, and all I do is I walk over it because I know where they live, or if I know something about them, I can go there immediately and find. I said, oh, well, it's right there. You just didn't see it. Or I usually find things for people. I can find them easier because they have energy lost, on it. Lost items. Yeah, I'm very good. Lost dogs. I just I just had to uh, take care of a person that couldn't find their dog, and I found her. Where was she? All of that. I've worked with murder. I've worked with the police before with murders. And how did that work work out? Well, it we found them. We they were dead, but we found them. You f they found the bodies. Yeah, we found them. So did you? You told them where the bodies were. Mm-hmm. And when you saw where the bodies were, how did? Did you see it visually, see it visually, or how did you see it? Saw it visually at first. I saw where they were on the side of the road. This this man was he murdered these these two people, and these people called me. Uh, a lot of times, if there's something going on, like a coroner, I have a real good friend that's a coroner, and he'll call me up and he says, "I think this was a murder. What do you think?" And I'll just say, "Now let me look." And uh, yep. She was murdered. And I said, this is how it looks like to me. And so he'll go back and research it. And he said, you're, and he'll call me back. He said, you're right. But they always call me. So you're familiar with Alison Dubois? Uh, well, I know. Yes, I know her. Yes. I know about her. I don't know her personally. Or anything. So did you watch the show Medium? I did a long time ago. Uh, some of that is really, it's very Hollywood series. It's not quite that way. I mean, she's be given an interview and she says the same thing. Um, you get there's it's a lot of different things that come in. I get taste sometimes. I don't I never did like getting taste. I didn't like getting bad taste or a bad smell because I don't like that. Uh, now, I have a couple of friends that have got that ability and they'll say there's something not right. I, I'm glad I don't have to do that. I don't like to do smells. So but I do feel a lot of things, or I'll, I'll have a, uh, something that I'll go and I'll say, man, that was, there's something not right here. Or I, a lot of times I'll find, um, like there's been a car accident and I'll see people standing on the side of the road and it's kids, or it's a person that did not realize they were dead. And I'll just turn around and say, do you realize you're dead? <laughs> They'll be gone. What there's else would you like to discuss? That's pretty much it. <laughs> I think I've, I've covered the gamut of everything that I normally do. It only took you twice as long as we expected. Yes. Which is fine. I mean, as long Which as you feel good the... because you can slow it down. And uh, I do. I get, when you get excited, you get on a roll with it and you can find it. But it's there and gone sometimes. So that, thank well, you very much for being slowing you, me down. You did a great job. Um, Tell, would do you want to promote yourself before we go? I don't need to be promoted. <laughs> I've done enough promoted. I don't want to be, I don't want you to put my name on. I mean, you can say my name. I don't want my email. You know, I put my email on thinking I didn't know Jeff was any big deal. I'm being honest. I did not know. I've done these podcasts all my 25 years. 
what, six, maybe seven. And I had thought, uh, I'll say, you know, and he was real excited. He said, you're going to tell him your email? And I said, well, sure. You know, I had no idea I was going to get 500 emails. 500. Crazy. Well, I hope, I hope you got some business out of that. Oh, there's, there's been, I could sit down and make 50 to $60,000 a business, but I'm, I'm 72 years old. I'm not working like that ever again. Uh uh-uh. I will pick and choose Jeremy, my uh, dear Jeremy, been with me for 15 years. He's one of my students and uh, he's a teacher like me and I'm feeding him. I said, here, take it, take it, take it, take it, build your practice off of this because he's a lot like me and he knows how to do it. So, yeah, I don't want to do a lot of work. I'm so is he a student of yours or associate? He's a student. He was a student of mine. And then uh, he has graduated into being who he is. He's a motivational speaker with me. We usually stand on stage together many times. If he gets a, a event, he'll call me and say, I want you to go to this event with me. Or I'll call him and say, I want you to go in and speak. We always kind of work at each other. So, yeah, this is I called him when we got when I got the 50 emails coming in the first day. I called him. And I said, I'm overwhelmed. And he's tech. He's a, a he's a big deal with the technology and he has his own thing. And so he said, don't worry, we'll get it all straightened up. So he did it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the tech guy, too. Well, that's good because I'm not. And I didn't want to be. So he did all of that. He did everything for us. I mean, he's done all of it, how it works. And he's very amazing. Well, I appreciate you coming on my show. Um, I have enjoyed it. it. Two hours went by. Oh, wow. Like, I'm so sorry. I hope it wasn't too long. No, no. Uh, I'm not complaining. I, I enjoyed the two hours and it seemed a lot shorter than two hours. Well, when you're in that state of mind, it does. It feels like it's very short. That means we did a very good job in the now of it. So thank you for being, uh, slowing me down. And I think that life is this way. You, um, When you're in grade school or high school or any kind of school, it's so boring. You think every moment lasts an hour. <laughs> yeah. And then a few minutes later, you're 70 years old. And you're like, where did my life go? Yeah. So life just went by in a flash. Yes, because you're wasting it all, all gone. Terrible thought, but that's true. Well, we spend our lives killing time when we yeah. wonder where time went. Yeah. And, uh, but it was a pleasure speaking with you. It's a pleasure. I will um, download these two files. Okay. Two now. I will uh, piece them together, edit them, add a a lead in and a, a lead out at the end and uh, and uh, I will render it all and upload it to YouTube and then I'll send you the link after I'm done. Okay. And uh, if you don't promote yourself, then you won't get 50 more emails. I don't want any more. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. I mean, I had a private, you know, business. I was under the radar for 15 years. I didn't know that that would be, you just don't know. They went into my, they went into my friends and they started talking to my friends and asking how they could get to know me. And, and, and they called me and they said, what the heck is there? Who are these people calling me? Because she wrote something on Jeff's and another friend did the same thing. They've been calling them. And I said, just ignore it. Just ignore it. <laughs> Well, people want to be healed, and they know you can heal. So, yeah, but uh, people not, are desperate for healing. Yeah, but they're desperate. See, when you're desperate, that's not the way to heal. Desperate is not healing. That's fear. And when you got fear, it's hard to even help anybody because they're too afraid. So, there's a lot more to that healing than you got to really understand how that works. And it's it takes six or seven hours. And some people think that it's going to happen in an hour. No, it won't happen in an hour. Well, the, I've seen it done. The guy that you pulled the out of his, uh, he had the black yeah. leg. Yeah, but I knew exactly that could be done in uh, less than an hour. But when you're talking about people that are victimized in deep, deep, 
energy, you know, emotion in it. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I work with people that have been raped, and those are deep issues. And I've been there, so I know what that's like. So it takes time. And you got to take a little bit at a time, you know, because it's layers. It's thin layers. It's not people. Don't, it's just like pulling off. You cannot. You've got to be very gentle because you can tear. Tears are hard to get over through your body. If you really know how to explain, you know, it's do it. It's much easier. But I've had to see a lot of people that have come in here that have been really messed up with a so-called healer. And I'm the one that has to clean it up. And I don't like that either. So. Well, so. thanks again. Let me uh, let me end this and uh, we'll go on. So nice okay. Well, it was a pleasure. And stop the recording. Us.